the title of my professoriate, so I'm going to come back to this at numerous points throughout, but had we been on campus with everyone there in the big lecture hall, then I definitely would have worn the, the beautiful doctoral robes of Greenwich, and especially just to doff my bonnet to our Vice-Chancellor, um, Professor Jane Harrington, and to each and every one of you. There are so many of you here from different parts of the world, different time zones. I'm truly humbled and honoured by the fact that you're all here. Um, and this is what I want to talk to you about, is sort of where I'm from to where I'm at at the moment, and especially looking forward to the future, because obviously the clock is ticking, and I'm certainly not getting any younger. So looking at where this is going to go. If any of you are using Twitter, and of course if you use TweetDeck, you can actually put a whole column in um, just to get the, the tweets coming in in live time, feel free to copy my uh, Twitter account in, or especially using the hashtag ProfSNG. And I'm really pleased to be able to do this on World AIDS Day of 2021. So, um, to get anywhere in academia, of course, we've all read lots of books and articles over the years, and uh, that's completely expected of each one of us. And no doubt many of us have got really, uh, really good favourites that we like returning to again and again. I'm going to mention a few of those throughout the presentation, but especially this one by Anthony Gray on speaking of sex, the limits of language. When Gray wrote his final chapter, it was looking at the 21st century, which he called 21st century, all change. But sadly, I've got to tell you, we haven't changed that much since Gray wrote this book. Um, whether we look at sexual health issues across the world or even closer to home, say, for example, um, here in the UK and especially in Northern Ireland, there are so many ways in which we still have to do more. Uh, for example, challenging gender and sexuality equalities or hostilities against people on grounds of abortion or stigma around HIV. Also ensuring a full range of access to all sexual, reproductive and HIV services for all people who need it. We've also still got a lot of work to do around female genital cutting or mutilation and sex trafficking and sex exploitation. And also in, re in relation to all sorts of sexual violence, abuse, rape femicide, queer hatred, the list goes on. And some of those nasty things can happen, both within what we call civil society and, of course, um, especially witnessed in refugees and asylum seekers, people who are coming from different war-torn parts of the world. So any sexual enlightenment that we do have in various countries is sometimes because of reactive issues. So maybe things go wrong. Uh, here in the UK, for example, we went through a period of time where we had unacceptably high numbers of um, uh, teenage pregnancies and different sexual infections with rising uh, infection rates. So sometimes stuff is done reactively because of that. Uh, but also proactively, especially when people want to get involved and do more. And that's something I'm really hoping for with this university, and I'll tell you about a little bit later. And it taps into a question I often ask my students, is that they, they should ask themselves, what difference can I make? So, um, to get to this position of the full professoriate, wonderful, wonderful indeed. Um, and I must say thank you to uh, Professor Susan Lee, who was our then outgoing Deputy Vice-Chancellor, now Vice-Chancellor of Hull, and to our then Vice-Chancellor, Professor David Maguire. They brought in this professoriate route uh, for teaching and learning and for enterprise. So thank you so much indeed. When I mentioned this book of Grey, speaking of sex, there was another one that was really influential for me uh, that I read as a teenager. It's transformational, really. And it was called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex, with an asterisk. And at the bottom of the page, it said, but we're afraid to ask. And I'm hoping I can uh, come on to that in our internal conference in a few months' time. But all of that spells out the reason why I still think we should be speaking of sex and still challenging the limits of language. So, 
as Karen said, uh, um, it, she told you a bit about my past, where I've come from, and I've got a few pictures to show you about that. But one thing I wanted to mention in particular, when I was first ordained in the Catholic Church, the very first uh, funeral I did was a cremation. And when I stood in the little pulpit, that was the sign that was sitting there in front of me. So I've been told how long I've got for this presentation, and I'm just hoping that no alarm is going to be sounded. So, where have I come from? As Karen was saying uh, uh, about my past, for any of you that have got good ideas of history or maths, try and work this out. I was born in the year of the Wolfenden Committee Report, which means that I was 10 when the Abortion Act and the first partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality in England and Wales um, uh, were given royal assent. So that's the time in which I was born and grew up. Uh, Karen mentioned about my nursing, first in orthopaedics and then for general nursing, state registered nurses we used to be called. Then there were those uh, 10 years with the Catholic Church, seven of them studying to be a, uh, a priest, especially with the Franciscans in Canterbury. But also... Um, uh, uh, working it back in nursing, after I left the priesthood, I moved to London and worked on an HIV ward at St Mary's in Paddington. And they were in those bad old days of the 1980s to work in HIV services that were portrayed really so well um, in a recent programme uh, series on television called It's a Sin. But of course we know it isn't. But because of those days, I've been really lucky to do a couple of television presentations on this. And it was on 32 years ago today that I actually met her, uh, her late Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. She opened the HIV ward I was on um, uh, on World AIDS Day of 1989. I've written a few blogs about those early days, and I still share them with students today, many of whom have got no idea about the historical past. So it was really, really important. Um, then, after working on that war just for seven months, I had the first meteoric rise in my career when I became a lecturer practitioner in HIV. Now, I know I've got some colleagues who talk about an imposter syndrome. Well, for me, the biggest time of imposter syndrome was then, because I jumped from what was a D-grade staff nurse to an H-grade lecturer practitioner. In today's banding, that's a band D to a, a, a band D to a band eight in one jump. But what, what was so um, worrying for me at the time, from the imposter syndrome point of view, was the fact that here I was designing an HIV course and I was having to teach people like ward managers, clinical nurse specialists, and all those in positions that I had never been in in nursing. So it really was quite intimidating until I remembered exactly why I got that post. Because on the day of the interview, um, I was actually late turning up for the interview. And the reason why was because some of the patients and my colleagues on the HIV ward had found out about, uh, about me having been a priest. I didn't want people to know at first. But when they did, one of the patients who was moving closer to death um, asked me if I would help him prepare his funeral. So I did. And then he asked me to do it for him. So on the day I was interviewed for my lecturer practitioner post, I had to phone the College of Nursing and say, look, I'm running a little bit late because I've just cremated a patient. And that was how I jumped that meteoric rise. Now, had my dear mother lived more than 75 years, she would have been 100 just 12 days ago. But when I told her that um, uh, I was teaching on this HIV course, and when I told her about some of the sexual matters that I had to teach, she said to me, oh, to think you get paid to talk filth. Now, she was joking, um, but obviously there was a little bit of seriousness with her as well, because uh, she was brought up as a good practising Baptist, and that's how she brought up my siblings and myself, bringing us up in quite a religious household. And in that case, another book I should remember, uh, uh, should, should mention then, is the Bible, because we were brought up on that in quite a strict way. And obviously the Bible tells you um, who you should be, how you should be, and certainly not for talking filth. So there was all of that. But it was during my student nurse days that I converted to Catholicism and um, I actually left parish ministry when I was 32 years old. So for those first 32 years of my life, obviously religion had quite a strong part to play.
Now, it still does in many ways with our students today, because sometimes in talking about sexual health issues, <clears throat> different aspects of religion do come up and do get mentioned. And the reason I'm showing you this photograph is because a team of four of us went out to Bahrain to run an HIV course quite a number of years ago. And one of the things I had to do was to do a condom demonstration. So I was showing all the nurses, all the students on the course, um, I was about to show them how to do a condom demonstration. When one of them said to me, thank you, David, but we don't need to know. And I thought she meant, well, because they're all nurses, they all understand how to do this, and they all know how to teach this to their clients and their patients. And I thought, well, I must just challenge my assumptions on that and just ask her, why don't you need to, do, to know? And she said, well, basically, if God intends you to get HIV, you'll get it. If he doesn't, you won't. So religion still plays quite a part in some of the teaching I'm doing, and I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Okay, so I'm thankful for all those, uh, those first 32 years of my life helping to bring me to where I am now today. But especially things like fear of talking of sex, erotophobia, fear of sex, and talking of sex can have a really negative impact both in clinical care and within our educational uh, um, establishments, especially challenging what we aim for today with equality, diversity, and inclusion for everyone. So, this personal chair, this professorial chair, why have I used this particular title? Well, um, first of all, when I, my, my first relations working with Greenwich on this was when I was employed to develop the sexual health skills course that used to be of the Royal College of Nursing. So I was employed by the RCN at the time, but I got the course credit rated at Greenwich immediately. And I then, uh, a few years later, uh, secured a post as senior lecturer at the university. But in this time, I've been really fortunate to be able to nominate two great people for honorary doctorates. The one is Baroness Joyce Gould for her work on sexual health policy. And the other one is Alison Hadley, OBE, for her work around teenage pregnancy practice. So a real great honour to be able to nominate those two honorary doctors. I've also had the real fortune to be able to nominate two visiting professors as well. Professor Anthony Price Curling back in 2012. And Anthony was spectacular in stepping up to help me as a new doctoral supervisor when our dear friend and colleague Professor Liz West became ill and died. So Anthony really stepped up there and supported me well. And... The other one, our current visiting professor in integrated sexual health and HIV, is Dr. Matthew Grundy Bowers, Fellow of the Royal College of Nursing. So I'm really grateful to have been able to nominate both of those. So, why did I choose, these, uh, uh, choose the title of Sexualities and Genders as the first part of my professorial title? Referring to genders in the plural gives me a great opportunity, especially when we're talking about gender, to show that we're not just talking about two, we're not just talking about male and female, but to be inclusive of all others, whether people are using uh, uh, titles for, uh, uh, for their gender or whether they're anti-labeling conventions. But I put the term sexualities before genders, and that was quite important as well, because sexualities is something that's often neglected across healthcare services and in healthcare um, education. And sometimes uh, students may even say to us that they find it embarrassing or difficult to talk about sexual health matters. So it's important that I raise the profile of this, especially by showing this uh, within my title. Now, by choosing the word sexualities in the plural also reminds everyone that we've all got a sexual orientation. And sometimes it's important to remind heterosexual people that they've got an orientation too, and theirs just happens to be the majority in most societies <clears throat> and the position of, uh, uh, of dominance. And I'll come back to these points in a little bit. So, when I was growing up as a child, I'd never actually heard of the word gay, except in relation to somebody being happy. But I knew that there was some sort of queer difference growing on in, going on inside me. Now, the only role models I had, so I've told you the year I was born, and uh, the year 
in which the first partial decriminalization of male homosexuality took place in England and Wales. So think back to those days, for those of you that can, and try to consider some of the role models. Now, when I use the word role models, I'm saying that very, very sarcastically, because, in fact, they were negative models to so many of us. If you looked at the television programmes, they were often sort of really outrageous camp, uh, um, you know, over caricatured images of what was seen to be very very unmanly or they might have been those who were blackmailed because of their orientation or maybe they were pathologized in psychiatry and across healthcare and demonized and cast out and we only need to think of alan turing his life and death to realize exactly what i'm talking about here so in thinking of sexualities and across history, somebody called Wayne Dines has got a really good statement that he says about Michel Foucault, that Foucault saw this as the modern state in particular has learned how to harness to its purpose such bodies of knowledge as medicine and the social sciences, which serve to colonize and subjugate uh, the individual and could think back to Alan Turing, and he's the clearest example of that subjugation. Now, even when we're talking about people coming out, about different aspects of maybe sexual orientation or, or uh, something within their lives that they've been concealed, it's really important that we must ask ourselves, what are we expecting people to come out of, and what are we expecting them to come out into? What sort of world are they actually coming out into? Now, let me just give you a quick example in relation to stigma theories. Somebody back in 1985, a team led by Edward E. Jones, they wrote on stigma theory and they spoke about the concept of concealability in course, which I was fortunate enough to write about in the book that you can see now. So they were speaking about concealability in course and it's as, re uh, as relevant as it was then uh, as it is now today. So really important, because concealability, when you think of anything to do with sexual health um, and sexualities, look at the ways in which some people may want to conceal certain things. So maybe it's hiding it uh, because of fear of stigma or taboo. And Irving Goffman in 1963 referred to this as the situation of the individual who is disqualified from social acceptance. Now, just because we have certain liberties here in the UK, that's not the same for all people, and certainly not the same for all peoples across the world. So Goffman's idea, talking about stigma as a mark or a sign of difference, um, also means it's putting a big responsibility on individuals, because if they do come out about something, they may be coming into a world that then wants to stereotype them. So it may be putting them into...
he does talk about all of these. So he's talking about church, law, politics, marketplace, love, children, sex, shame, and sex, hate. But the ones I'm going to focus on are just the ones in to, uh, to do with uh, uh, religion, because that's where I have come from, even though I'm not religious at all today. Okay? But I think it's important to say that. Because uh, right across Gray's discourses, he's looking at ways in which these different powers within society actually constrain what we might be able to say or think or do or say in relation to all different aspects of sex and sexualities. And even when you consider words like um, patriarchal hegemony, you know, the way in which so many societies, males dominate over females. But it's not just dominating over females, it's dominating over any others that aren't like them. So whether that's through sexism or transphobia, or on grounds of uh, sexual orientation difference. So words like heterosexism, heterosupremacy, homophobia, biphobia, all these are different sorts of powers that emanate from these different uh, aspects of society that Gray was actually talking about. It's also important for us to remember that all of these different uh, groups within society are the ones that actually decide what they consider to be good and right and proper within society, and likewise all the things they think opposite, and therefore things that they would demonize. That's really important especially when we're thinking of uh, um, issues like the, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Because right across the globe, people are denied access to sexual reproductive health, um, all different types of preventative services, because of some of the powers within their own societies. So very important that we consider that, and not just ourselves, but when you consider our students, where a huge percentage of them in health have come from different parts of the world, they're bringing lots of that knowledge and experience uh, with them. Now, um, being brought up the way I was, the way I told you about, there was a real clear notion of uh, um, uh, gender stereotypes here, the Adam and Eve stories. And even when you think of that, l listen to some of the discourses that go along with it. So, it, you know, man was born first, Adam was born first, Eve from his rib, she tempted him, he's the one that then fell. And when you think of things like marriage, there's love, honour and obey, till death us do part, all these are different ways of talking about sex. Now, if, as Lord Alfred Douglas said back in 1892, that homosexuality was called the love that dare not speak its name, from the point of view of some of these stories in society, you might say that heterosexuality is the love that need not speak its name, because there's no need to, because nobody else is going to be different from it. So very, very important there. And that means that in so many of our students' minds, when they're talking to us about sexual relations, for example, it may be that they're coming from such a background and they, not, they haven't explored uh, ideas talking about anything different there. Now, with Michel Foucault itself, he says that there's this centrifugal movement towards what he calls monogamous heterosexuality. And that's really important for us to consider as well. So, looking at the history
and that's important for us to remember. So uh, Gray, uh, with his work, he's quite um, essentialist in his views on sexual orientation, uh, seeing that there's a great need to work for equality for people on the grounds of their sexual orientation. And he worked so hard for many decades, working in two organisations, one that was called the Homosexual Law Reform Society and the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. And he traces um, the impact of negativities, not just against people who are different in society, but how that mapped out across his own life. Foucault is a very different person. Although he wrote his, um, his works on sexuality earlier than Gray, he's very much later in his form of thinking, whether critically or analytically. Very, very di different. So Gray was looking at the various powers within society, and because of that, he was actually awarded the Stonewall Lifetime Achievement Award for his work. On, uh, um, on equality. And this is a little saying that he came out with when he received that great award, that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, and ours is a never-ending struggle, not just for our own rights, but for human rights. Really very important there. Now, uh, Foucault, a very different theorist, steps away from looking at the actual structures in society and rather he gives us a toolbox that we can use ourselves to critique and analyse our own stories. Um, Foucault actually looked at the ways in which not just power interrelates with people but importantly how resistance to all sorts of power actually queer and critique the powers that are seen to be within various societies. So these two men have given us very different ways of looking at the topic areas uh, of sex, sexualities, sexual health and well-being. And the tightrope I've been walking this evening is between these two different men and the two different ways in which they conceptualise this. So, still speaking of sex, why is there a need to do it? So here we go, structurally um, reconfiguring sexual health. It's important for us to ask who's missing in all of this. And that's a picture of my mother, and I wanted to show you her because she was ginger. And this is the little story I'm going to tell you. When I did my own doctoral research, listening back to some of the recordings to transcribe them, it sounded as if one of the respondents was talking about the problems of sexuality for ginger people. She went very quiet. So I had to play it again and she says the problems of sexuality for ginger people. And I thought, well, surely she's not saying the problems of sexuality for ginger people. So I even Googled this. What are the problems of sexuality for ginger people? And <laughs> there weren't any. Nothing was coming up at all. Until I listened over and over again to what she was saying. And then I realised that she was saying the problems of sexuality and gender for people. So not ginger people at all. So you might be asking, so why am I mentioning ginger people? Well, it's really important because in many societies, intersex people are as numerous as ginger people. And yet, whoever talks about intersex people? Which, en which uh, clinical services address intersex people? How often do we even mention it across teaching, learning and assessment? So in a way, he is a perfect example of what Foucault referred to as someone who's taboo silenced and therefore seen to be non-existent. So whether we're talking about sexual orientations, gender identities, all the various aspects of sexual and reproductive health, it's really important for us to realise that lots of people, for many, many different reasons, can be hidden from the work that we're doing and especially for us as teachers and the way in which we talk about all of this. Okay, and uh, uh, certainly looking for respect for all people means that we've got to address everyone, uh, especially within our educational services, look at ways of bringing people in that are going to be respectful of all others. Now, this is what we're doing at Greenwich in pre-reg and post-reg. 
in my own doctoral study, I actually came out with this model, which I call the triptych model. And it's looking at sexual health from three different dimensions. And only a matter of months ago, in the Lancet Public Health Journal, there was a really excellent article looking at sexual well-being and exploring what do we mean by the term sexual well-being. And it was written by Mitchell et al., in the, uh, the Lancet Public Health uh, Journal. When they're talking about sexual well-being, it's very different to just talking about sexual health. And if you look at this own model uh, from, my, for, from my doctoral thesis, the well-being is especially for the holistic person there in the centre of our care. And when we look at all our different codes of conduct, look how they tell us we need to prioritise people. It's the individuals we're caring for are the ones that we need to prioritise. So really important there that we consider all the different dimensions of sexual health and well-being, including including citizenship rights and including rights to sexual pleasure, we incorporate those within our dimensions of holistic care. But also in one of the other panels here, it's showing the image of, of, of a person and that's re re relating to any other forms of illness. So whoever you're coming across, whichever clients you've got, how might their illness or their condition or their abilities or disabilities actually impact on their sexual health, on their rights to pleasure, on their sexual well-being? So there's the holistic dimensions, there's the dimensions which are secondary to other conditions, and finally, you see on the panel there, the traditional um, services, which are often under the umbrella term of sexual health uh, services. Now, it's really important that we uh, consider these, especially when we're teaching our students. And here's just a few images of some of the sessions that our undergraduate students have uh, with us here in the School of Health Sciences. So lots of ways of customising aspects of sexual health and well-being across their own programmes, whether that's the four different branches of nursing, midwifery or paramedic science. Really important that we're covering all these differences. And I've also managed to uh, share some of these messages as well in national and international conferences. Now, when it comes to postgraduate studies, what difference can we make there? Um, a few years ago, I was really fortunate to do a presentation at the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Sex and Reproductive Health, and we were all asked to explore two main documents, one on medical education and one on nursing education, and we all had to address this from the point of view of the, the, the sexual health that we're providing in relation.
part in the making the invisible visible. Both these are really important documents for us to consider, both across the whole university and within our school as well. Um, both of them show that students want more. They want more teaching across all of these different aspects, whether it's sex, relationships, health, gendered health, all these different things, students are saying they want more. But equally, so many healthcare educators are saying that they want to be able to provide more, but maybe they don't feel as if um, um, they've got the knowledge or skills to be able to doing it. In the Making the Invisible Visible, there's a wonderful little quote there that says that many academics have a longing for direction and guidance on teaching content as there is uncertainty about what to include. So, here are my two suggestions. Within our School of Health Sciences, um, uh, really important here that, that, that we look at ways of focusing on this, that no health without sexual health, no education without sexual health education. So what I'm going to propose, and uh, Professor Karen Cleaver hasn't heard this yet, so what I'm wanting to propose here is that we set up a voluntary group for anyone within our own school that may think, well, the programmes they run could have issues of sexual or gendered health, but maybe they're not too sure what, so what can they implement? But if we got together as a group, it'll give us wonderful ways of sharing knowledge, sharing learning with each other, and maybe even sharing all of our resources as well. And then likewise to do a similar thing right across the university. So whether people are teaching history or art, uh, geography to film studies or anything in between, look at the ways that they can make the currently invisible visible. So looking back throughout history, how have people been to uh, um, uh, related to differently, whether because of genders, orientations, uh, illness, infections, all that type of thing. So really important that we integrate this right across our university. And here we are in our 21st century. So if I did come back in many years' time, what I'd love to see is that the building th that's gone on so far, to see it move even more, so that people can feel totally confident in thinking they're no longer afraid to talk about any of this. It'll be really, really important to do it. I can't believe that I've managed to finish this on time, uh, but on behalf of my husband John and myself, I thank every one of you for being here, for listening, for giving your attention, and just for being you. Thank you.